Hey guys, in today's episode, we're gonna talk about one of my favorite topics, correlations in the markets, but we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into it and look at it in a different way, talking probabilities and expectations. Correlations. Um, got the question from a trader. Hopefully he's listening. I don't see him in here, but hopefully he's listening. Says, um, I always have problems with correlations. For example, if I want to sell the euro dollar, but then realize the dollar Canada has a sell setup at the same time, should I take both? Last time I took both, the outcome was great. Well, either one was hit with the stop loss. But then my full-time trader friend said that I should choose one. This made my life um, tough. I don't know which one to choose and ended up trading the one that I wanted to see. I ended up taking the setup I love the most. I realized that this has a cost. Uh, this has cost me a lot of money actually. What should I do? Um, so that I don't let other pairs analysis have any impact on the one I'm looking at. So you guys know where I stand, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys answer the first part of this question. So the trader is looking at in a situation where he's got two different setups on two different pairs, let's say a, a euro dollar and a dollar Canada, and he's buying both. So what that means is essentially he is buying the, he's basically selling the US dollar on the first pair and buying the US dollar on the second pair. Um, and he says, uh, should he take both? So how would you guys answer that question? We just did all these, all these Q and A's run together. But if you're listening, Barry, we did another one on these. It had to be less than a month ago. Should he take both? What do you guys think? Both, take one, take none. Yeah, take both. Again, we're, we're all assuming these are 100% valid setups that meet the rules of engagement in the trade plan. So the trader needs to take both. And I would say that and maybe you don't want to listen to your full-time trader friends. Um, or maybe you do, but understand that they may trade a, a different way than you do. They may have different rules. They may have a different technique. They may have a longer duration outcome. Um, we're all gonna be a little bit different with how we trade. And like Gorsi just said, you should not care what, what others say. And you have to look at, and again, this is the, I do think there's a difference if you're investing, like say in the stock market, it's a little bit of a different case here. But what makes Forex unique is the fact that we do have pairs, that it's, you're not just, buying the 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 dollar index and and buying different indices out there right currency indices you are literally involving yourself in a battle between one pair and another pair so the the value of the value of the pair that you're buying or and selling is only in comparison to the other pair that you're buying or selling against so you can look at the euro dollar, what happens on the euro dollar doesn't really have too much to do with what's happening on the dollar Canada um, because maybe you value the euro different than you do the loonie. Now, again, there are there going to be situations where you see the markets moving in tandem where they all move together? Yes, right? If, if the dollar is the most popular pair, it's the biggest pair out there, right? So if, you, if, if there's horrible dollar news out, guess what? You're going to see all the dollar pairs react the same across the board. Um, now, they may react slightly differently depending on the strength of the currency pair that they're going up against, um, but you are going to see that happen. But I, I don't think you should confuse that with correlation, for example. Um, so again, we, we, we've done this topic millions of times, but I want to approach it a little bit of different, a different way. What, for you guys, what helps you, because it is a tough dilemma. It, it is hard to be, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've been long pound dollar and short euro dollar at the same time and I just feel uncomfortable. 
Um, I think that is normal where you're being like, hey, like, <laughs> what of these is probably going to lose? Um, what is something that helped you become more comfortable with that decision? Because it's one thing to make it. Um, it's another thing to be comfortable with it. Because if you're not comfortable with it, you're, you may end up self-sabotaging, panicking when things look like they're going wrong. So what, if anything, have you done? What, if anything, have you told yourself? What, if anything, do you think to get your right, yourself in the right mind state for these correlated situations? Or she says, confidence in your system. Nikki follows that up with back-tested data. Matthew says, if a valid setup is there, take it. So process over outcome, very process-driven and, and valuing taking good trades over any type of result, right? Process over results. Prasant says, same, same here, back-tested data. Yep. And the interesting thing in backtesting, right? When we backtest data, we typically do it individually, right? Would I be correct in saying that? All you guys go pair, one pair at a time, pair by pair? And then maybe at the end, at the end we combine it to get our portfolio. But think about it like this. When you're backtesting and you're looking at each pair individually, are you ever making a comparison to what another pair is doing? Are you ever backtesting your euro dollar and you're on like January 20th, 2000 and you're like, you know what, I should go and see what the pound dollar is doing at the same time to make sure I'm not in the same trip, right? You never do that. It's all independent, right? They're, they're each independent employees, essentially, that eventually come together to make your business stronger. But if we're not worrying about correlations during our testing, why are we worrying about it during our real life trading? Or is it all just one big mental trap? Is it all just, um, what is it, uh, the fear, right? False evidence appearing real. Are we creating this fear to, and this doubt to self-sabotage ourselves? Right? Something I like to think about when it comes to this situation is, I like to think about probabilities, right? I, I have completely shifted didn't happen this way at, at, at first, but over the years, I've completely shifted to thinking in probabilities when it comes to a trade, right? And, and, and that's why like no, no single trading opportunity gets me down. No single trading opportunity really gets me excited. Like, like before, you know, before the trade happens, like I, I, you know, I, I get a, if I get a big winner, I'm, I'm going to be like, yeah, that was cool. If I get a big loser, I'm like, ah, that was bad. But um, but before I get into a trade, I never look at it like, oh, this is the this is the trade right here. This is gonna win or this is gonna lose. I understand that I'm playing a a, a bigger game, a much longer game, and it's all about probabilities. And that probabilities don't show their true hand until very far in the future, right? Think about it like this, right? If you have a, if you know that whatever you're trading has a 60% hit rate and you start off 0 for 1, is there any reason to panic? Right? It's like, uh, think, think about professional baseball. I take that because that sport is entirely too long. I play 162 games, right? Does one game, if they lose the first game, is your season over? No. If you're Arsenal and you get beat in the first two weeks of the Premier League, is your season over? Eh, eh. The way they looked. Ah, bad example, Akil. I had to get my Arsenal shots in. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but no, it's not over. It's not over. They can they can still rally and turn things around, right? Look at, you know, Chelsea did that last year. Um, they didn't start off as bad, but you see what they did. Um but yeah, you got to think about it in probability. So when you picture things in probabilities, right, you look at it as an individual, right? You look at it as in like, hey, I'm, I'm not predicting this is going to win. I'm not predicting this is going to lose. Process driven. Oh, this other thing that's correlating with it. I'm not predicting it's going to win. I'm not predicting it's going to lose. Process driven. I know that bigger picture 
if I continue to take these type of trades, I should expect this type of result. This is just a, was it a, a means to an end? This is just the stepping stones, right? And it could be one step forward, one step back, but this is just the stepping stones to get to that ultimate destination. So I think it was, um, it might've been Matthew who said this earlier. I forgot who it was, sorry. If, a, if, if it's a valid setup, take it. I think it was Matthew. If it's a valid setup, setup take it. That is my only goal in the market is to find valid setups and execute with with zero prediction of the outcome, zero short term expectation of the outcome. Now, that's easier said than done. I, you know, it's easy for us to say it. It's harder in, in real life, but. As you gain more experience and, and, and over time, you become, I guess, more, you, you believe in it more, you become more numb to it, and you kind of stop feeling the pressure of, of kind of making decisions that are really out of your hand. Because if we do make a decision, if we have two pairs that both give us valid setups and we decide to take one or the other, Right. That's basically like betting a lot of money on a, a, a single hand of blackjack or betting all of our money on the first hand of poker or betting all of our money on a single single coin flip. Right. You have no idea if it's going to work in your favor. Right. You could be the, the best poker player in the world. You may just get a bad hand. and There's nothing you can do with it. The rest of your hands could be complete. You know, it could be the best, but you never get there if you don't get past that first one. So you can't kind of pick and choose which ones you want to do. You just have to, boom, stick to your stick to your plan and go with it. It goes back to my, uh, again, trading. I, I, I haven't gambled in a very long time. I'm probably want my bank account's a lot bigger now. But I used to play craps, and I, and I took the same trading. I always say trading helped my craps. Um, you guys familiar with the craps, craps game at all in the casino? It, it's, it's a true game of, I think they're all games of probabilities, but... True game of probabilities. All right, let me see if I can bring a, a picture over for you. But craps is my game of choice. It's one of the, you, you don't have an edge, right? The house still has an edge. But it's one of the games where you have kind of more of an edge than other games. But what you do is you get a craps table, right? If you're watching, you, you can see it in front of you. And the numbers kind of at the top of the the, um, the screen, right? Those are the numbers that you can bet on, right? There's other stuff like there's funky bets in the middle. Those are the ones where they try to get you where it's like, hey, 10 to 1 odds if it, you get, you know, land on two threes. It's like, you know, you're never, you're never going to win that. So you're just wasting money. That's how they try to get your money. But the numbers at the top, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, those are the numbers that you could place your bet on. And each of those numbers has specific odds on how likely it is to get hit right you have you have two dice right so there are what there are four ways you can get a four hit you can get a two and two you can get a three and one another three and one and another two and two right now what number do you think has the the best odds to get hit if you just look at the combination of of dots on a dice I, i'll give you a clue it's the number that you don't see in front of you The number that has the, 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 the most ways of getting hit, the highest probabilities of getting hit when you roll two dice are, or is, the, I see someone typing so I don't want to spoil it. It's literally the number that's not on the chart in front of you. The seven, right? You can get a six and a one. You can get a five and a two. You can get a four and a three, right? You can get another four and a three and all the way backwards, right? So if a seven is hit, that's when the house wins, unless you're betting against the house, you know, against everyone else, right? But basically, if you get a seven, that your turn's over and you lose all your money, right? So the idea is that for each, the idea with the, that the casino has is it know it, it knows it has the odds of winning, and if you think about your average player, they're gonna place a bet what probably on a random number each time. If you guys are playing this, if you're new, right? Maybe four this time, and then, oh, next time I'll do six. Uh, maybe nine or ten, right? It, it's all random. And, and, and as you do random stuff, are you increasing or decreasing your odds? If you take a random approach, you, 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 you take this pattern sometimes, but the next time you don't take it, right? You're decreasing your odds. 
right? Because now you're just you're you're just you're randomly hoping that the number comes up at the same time that you decide to pick it. So understanding this, what me and my me and my my gambling partner used to do, right? We just had a very consistent approach, just like trading. Where we didn't look at, and when I, when I first started trading, I did the same thing, or first started gambling, I did the same thing. I'd like randomly put it on four, then a five would get hit. So next time I put it on five, then a six would get hit. Then I put it on six, and now the four was hit again. And I, I would just always be one step behind, and eventually you win a little bit, and it keeps you in the game, right? Just like trading in golf. You, you, you're you discouraged, and you get a win, and it sucks you back in. It's horrible. Um, so what do you think we started doing when we were playing craps? Now, I'll tell you that the six and the eight have better odds than the four, five, nine, or ten. So the six and the eight are probably the, the the ones with the next two highest odds. So how do you think I approached the game of craps once I looked at it from a, a probability perspective? Did I do random stuff and bet on random numbers? No, I was consistent, right? So I didn't place it on seven, no. Um, my friend actually did that. Um, it, it's... You can do that. It, it makes the other people at the table angry because basically you're hoping that they lose. And craps is kind of a community game. So you get a lot of mean stares and it's, you, you kind of kill the mojo because everyone else, oh, seven, everyone loses. And my friend's like, yes. And they're like, hey, man. Hey. Hey. So <laughs> I never did that because I didn't want to get I didn't want to be that guy getting getting slugged at the table. Um, but what I would do is. We, we would take our bet and we would split it. And every single roll, or at the beginning of every single roll, we would cover four of the numbers. Six and eight were always covered, and it was either five or nine or four and ten. We'd cover four of the numbers, right? And then once we won, because what happens is if, if, the, if your number rolls, you get you know some money. Instead of putting that money in our pocket, we would then put those winnings... Right after after we made our initial bet back, I should say after after we made our initial bet back, so whatever we put on the table after we made our initial bet back, which happened on a couple of rolls, we would then put any profits on the other two numbers. So eventually, we would have all the numbers covered. Right, four, five, six, eight, nine, uh, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, and then you start banking your profits. And then you just hope that a seven doesn't get hit. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, you, you play, you basically, you survive for the hot roll. It's pretty similar to any trend traders out there. Like I know Andrew does this, right? So you, this will make sense. With, with trend trading, you're typically going to lose a lot, right? If you ever read the story of Richard Dennis and the turtle traders, um, some of them had like under 20% win percentages. They'd, they'd lose, one guy, uh, I think Curtis Faith, and he lost like 15 times in a row, but then he got one winner and it made up for it. So craps is the same way that seven's going to come. Eventually you're going to, you know, you're going to lose some money, you're going to break even, you're going to lose some money, but eventually you're you're playing for the hot roll. So the hot roll is basically when someone rolls forever and never hits a seven. And if you got everything covered, you're essentially making money on every single roll. And some of these hot rolls can last like a half an hour. Right? So it's the same thing as waiting for like a trend, right? You lose, you lose, maybe you break even, you manage risk, you lose a little bit, you break even, you manage risk, right? Small loss, small loss, small loss. And then you capture that big trending move. You capture that big four, five, six, 700 plus trending move. And that makes up for all the smaller losses that you did. Psychologically very tough, but that's the game. So that's what we would do in the craps table. And we used to get yelled at by the, um, the game managers, right? Evil stairs, because... They knew we were playing the right way. We were very consistent, right? We were playing the probabilities. What do you want to bet on? You want to bet on box cars, right? 30 for one, 30 for one, snake eyes. No, give me four, five, six, eight. Next round, 15 for one. What do you want? Um, four, five, six, eight. Oh, mega bet on the middle. Pass line. Big six, big six, big six. What do you want? I'll take a four, five, six, eight. And we just consistently played the probabilities. Consistently played the probabilities. And in the long run, that gave us the best chance at success. So it's the same thing in trading. If you have, if you have correlated pairs, and again, the key is they both have valid trading setups. If you're picking and choosing one or the other, you're no different than me at the craps table. Uh, sometimes four, sometimes eight, oh, sometimes nine, sometimes six. 
right? You're, you're, you're hoping, you're, you're wishing. If you're consistent, you're not going to win every time. But if you've done your back testing, if you trust your back testing results, you know that longer picture, bigger picture, the probability is going to be on your favor. You're going to win. That seven is eventually going to get hit. So your job is not to pick when you're going to win. Your job is not to pick the winning time and avoid the losing time. No, it's to just consistently play so that when everything compiles, you have more winners or maybe more, not more winners, but more profit in your favor. So a long way to say, take the trade. Take both of them every single time. Any questions about correlations? I get that question a lot, so I always got to think about different ways to kind of talk about it so it doesn't get repetitive. It's good apple juice here in the background. All right. Second question for today's Q&A. And this one is I'm, I'm going to require you. Oh. guys enjoyed the podcast remember show your support by following me on whatever app you're listening to this on also give me a follow on social media the handle is at akil stokes rtm don't feel uh, shy about reaching out i do answer each and every question that i get so reach out be a friend